Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining today. My name is Meredith Lehman and I'm the head of education here at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. Well, I'm joining from my home nearby. Um, the talk today is organized as part of our new perspective series, which spotlights emerging scholars in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Washington University. The talks focus on one or more works of art from the collection and align with the speaker's expertise and scholarly interests. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, who is Jenny Wu. Uh, Jenny is a master's student in the Department of Art History and Archaeology. Her work, um, her research focuses on contemporary art and new media from an interdisciplinary perspective. She also holds an MFA in fiction writing from Washington University, and her work can be found in Bomb Magazine, Denver Quarterly, The Literary Review, and Asymptote Journal. Jenny's talk today, To Do Without People, Maura Davies' Impossible Renunciation, will explore Davies' photographs of unpeopled interiors in relation to issues of ownership, medium, and the representation of space and time. We're all very much looking forward to her talk. And we also hope that you will participate in the conversation by sharing questions during the hour using the Q&A feature, which is located at the, on most devices at the bottom of your screen. So you have um, questions that you can submit throughout the hour through the Q&A. We'll also have some time at the end to answer your questions. And we also welcome you to share any observations or reflections on the artwork using the chat function, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. And you just wanna make sure that that is set to all panelists and attendees, and that way you can communicate with each other and share ideas. So uh, the Q&A feature for questions and chat to just share observations and reflections. Um, just a quick note that today's webinar will um, be recorded and that will be available for you if you'd like to revisit the talk or for those um, uh, people who are unable to attend, it will be available on our YouTube channel and I will share the link uh, to that in our chat in just a moment. Um, but with that, um, I turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Meredith, for the introduction and for the hard work you've put in behind the scenes uh, organizing these new perspectives talks. Um, I'm so happy to be here to talk about Moira Davy and four of her enigmatic and evocative photographs um, in the Kemper's collection. Uh, later on in the talk, I will be soliciting some of your responses to these works. So um, if you would like to participate, there will be an option for you to do so in the chat, um, which is located at the bottom of your window. So the occasion for me proposing this talk in the summer of 2020 was the publication of Davies' latest collection of essays, Index Cards, which came out of New Directions in late May of last year. I thought, what an exciting opportunity to engage with this incredible artist, both on a visual level and on a textual level. And I was intrigued by the set of photographs in the Kemper's collection um, that marked a certain phase of Davies' practice. Um, we'll examine what this idea of the renunciation of the figure uh, means in the context of these photographs, as well as in other media Davy works with. So Moira Davy was born in Toronto in 1958. She is a Canadian photographer, filmmaker, and writer who lives and works in New York City. Um, she was a student first at UC San Diego, um, then at the Whitney's Independent Study Program. And Davy works primarily in three modes, uh, photography, film and video, and writing. Um, on this slide, we can see a still from one of her films, uh, Les Goddess, uh, one of her C prints or chromogenic prints, Fridge, and the cover of the book I mentioned, Index Cards. The cover of the book is in fact also one of her photographs of the kind we'll examine today, uh, much like Fridge. This is a passage from an essay by Davy titled Les Goddess from 2011. I like the title of the film. Um, it reads, to do without people is for photography the most impossible of renunciations, wrote Walter Benjamin. Um, and this is in Benjamin's essay, A Small History of Photography from 1931. To do without people is for photography the most impossible of renunciations. Yet that abandonment is precisely 
what would begin to take place in my photographs, baby's photographs, over the 10 years beginning in 1984, until my subjects constituted little more than the dust on my bookshelves or the view under the bed. Here, Davy describes a retreat into the private realm. The C print or chromogenic print, uh, which is a photographic print made from a color negative or slide, uh, depicts Davy's kitchen, uh, specifically her refrigerator, in a way that doesn't try to create drama out of the quotidian, um, but rather shows its static qualities um, and really revels in them. It also doesn't try to create a perfect picture of domesticity, um, as you can see the messy and precarious wires extending out of the electrical sockets um, to the left of the fridge and here to the right. Um, and then to the left of the composition, you can see a sliver of doorway. Um, and this use of space or suggestion of space plays an important role in her photographs. So these are the four photographs held at the Kemper. When one first encounters them, they're somewhat baffling, right? They're deceptively simple, um, but it's not immediately obvious to the viewer how one should be engaging with them, um, how one should think about them or be affected by them emotionally. Um, we'll examine this tension between looking and interpreting, seeing and reading, and uh, try to engage with them um, through other photographs that are, in my opinion, a bit easier to grasp. So um, for the next four slides, I'm going to be comparing Davies photographs to um, some other photographs, um, some of which are held in the Kemper's collection um, and some that aren't. Oops. Here we have Richard Long's A Line Made by Walking uh, next to Davies' receiver. I'm bringing up Long's photograph as an example of something that can be read as conceptual art. The photograph shows a line of grass um, in a field that has been walked on. Um, this line is evidence, right, that the artist has walked through the field. Um, underneath the photograph, which serves as the documentation of the act done by the artist, is the artist's handwriting um, in pencil, noting the year and the place, um, in this case, England, uh, where this line was made. You can see that even if the artist had walked through a different field uh, with trees in the background, framed in a similar way, and, and the photograph said, England uh, 1967 under it, um, the photograph would still function similarly. The artwork um, would still retain um, its idea. Um, in other words, the idea behind the work is more important than the particular product. Um, and what's important is that the artist walked on the grass. Um, so one may try to engage with the photograph um, by Davy on the left um, through a conceptual lens. Um, there's much similarity between floor and a line made by walking. Um, for example, they both depict exactly what they're titled. The photographs are figureless. Um, they contain traces of the artist, um, but there are no explicit people in them. Um, in Davy's case, the dust shows an apartment uh, that has been lived in, and perhaps one that isn't impeccably clean. Um, but when we ask ourselves, could this have been any floor, you know, any dusty floor under some furniture, we're not as sure about the answer as we might be in Long's case. The visual intrigue of the dust, the light, the plastic, um, and the shadow of the furniture seems to be just as important as the floor and the concept of a bedroom or living room floor. The composition is strikingly more complex than a line made by walking. Um, and yet it's difficult to imagine that Davy arranged the dust in this particular manner, um, whereas the line made by Long um, was clearly a deliberate act. So Davy appears to be thinking about the concept of floor, um, but it seems also, she seems also interested in capturing a particular image in a particular room. Here we have Man Ray's lampshade next to Davy's speaker um, and light. Lampshade is an example of a photograph that can be read through the lens of abstraction. Um, generally, when we think of abstract art, uh, we're not thinking about representing the world as we see it. Um, we're thinking about the form and the composition and the color rather than what the function of these objects are in the real world. In fact, abstract photographers often use functional objects and arrange them into certain patterns, shapes, and colors that are expressive. Um, in the Man Ray, we're not seeing the lampshade necessarily as a lampshade, but as a spiral form. Um, the right side of the composition is darker than the left side, 
And the patches of light and dark create this three dimensionality. Um, at the same time, the shadow in the middle um, here, next to the shadow on the wall, um, flattens the figure against the background. Um, you can see that the kinds of things we tend to notice as viewers um, have to do with the composition, um, the interplay, um, the shapes of the shapes and tones, uh, rather than the fact that this is a lampshade um, or any associations with the lampshade as an object. We can also think of Davies' photographs in terms of their abstract qualities. Um, speaker has a strong diagonal line um, that is the edge of a table um, and high contrasting colors that flatten the tabletop um, and the rest of the room beyond it into these two geometric planes of color. The concentric circles of alternating dark brown and off white on the speaker itself also disrupt our perception of figure and ground, positive and negative space. Um, we can start to think of these photographs as pulling away from mimetic representation, um, but then there are these objects in the background. For example, you see a box cutter, a tape dispenser, a glass of water, and a book that appears to spell out mother, uh, more on that later. Um, in the 24 by 20 inch print, uh, these details may not jump out at you, um, but they intrigue you, right? And when you look more closely, you can tell what they are. So even though the speaker and the table are being rendered as form and color, um, so there's certainly an anti-memetic quality. These objects in the background, which appear almost to be hiding behind the speaker, um, retain their referential quality, telling us about the person who has these objects. And when you look at light, you might likewise think of the concentric circles, uh, the interplay of light and shadow, um, as being, you know, this photograph is concerned with color, form, and pattern. Um, but unlike Man Ray's lampshade, we can see little evidence of Davy attempting to abstract the light fixture using other parts of the composition. Um, there are no shadows dividing the composition in half or um, other shapes for the shape of the light fixture to play off of. Another attempt to understand Davy's photographs may be through the lens of still life. Um, here we have a still life photograph um, taken by Ansel Adams titled Still Life San Francisco next to Davy's receiver. And um, the Ansel Adams photograph shows some everyday household items. Um, there's bottles, eggs, and an egg cutter, and they're all tightly packed together on a flat surface. Um, they're clearly arranged together as a group and presented to the viewer. Um, the tallest objects in the back, the smaller objects up front, the photograph is very focused, right? And the lines are clean. So we can see the objects very clearly. So this is a fairly straightforward still life. Um, and still life is in fact a popular way of looking at Davies photographs. Um, and the idea behind still life is that the photograph is concerned with an arrangement of objects, um, often common everyday objects um, that are maybe man-made um, or natural. Um, unlike an abstract photography, the objects are not abstracted into lines and colors, but rather they remain objects. Um, the viewer finds pleasure in how the objects are arranged. In the Ansel Adams photograph, the egg is an egg, the bottles are bottles, and the composition is formed by how the egg is next to the bottle or how it's in the egg cutter. Receiver is like a still life um, in that it depicts glass vessels here, um, a receiver or the CD player on top um, and other not so extraordinary personal items um, on the table. So this, these items are arranged um, in an intentional manner or so it appears. The CD player is on top of the receiver. The glass vessels um, are in the foreground, lower in the composition. Uh, the arrangement creates a sense of order and hierarchy among the objects and it allows the eye to travel diagonally. Where it deviates from a still life is in the use of space. The objects are not crowded together on a surface, right? The glasses are far away from the rest of the objects. Um, and the objects are not arranged around the receiver, um, unlike the Ansel Adams photograph, where the kitchen objects are arranged around the eggs. Um, the space itself then becomes part of the composition. And though the objects still draw the viewer's attention, the viewer is invited to engage with the empty area and feel the space atmospherically. In fact, the figureless quality of receiver feels more akin to these photographs by Eugene Etche, 
um, rather than still life. These are um, two street photographs taken by Ache titled Church of St. Gervais and Corner of Rudisson. Um, Ache's photography career bridged the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, he's known as a French flinner and is credited as a pioneer in the genre of documentary photography. Much like in Receiver, the space becomes part of the composition and we're drawn to the atmosphere of the figureless street. Walter Benjamin, one of Davies' philosophical interlocutors, as we saw before, um, writes regarding Eche's photographs of Paris, quote, they are devoid of humans. It has been justly said that he photographed them like scenes of a crime. A crime scene too is devoid of humans. It is photographed for the purpose of establishing evidence. With Eche, photographic records begin to be evidence in the historical trial. They demand a specific kind of reception. Free floating contemplation is no longer appropriate to them. They unsettle the viewer." End quote. When we look at Edge's photographs, the point of view is that of a flaneur, someone who wanders through the city streets and is comfortable standing there um, to capture certain scenes, gathering evidence um, as though he felt a certain ownership over the city. Um, the exposure time for these photographs were quite long, so he had to have stood there for um, quite a while at ease in the crowd, um, committed to his task, and there would have been people um, on these streets. Um, so perhaps we can understand Davy's photographs in terms of her subject position. Um, art historian Marcus Verhagen, in fact, analyzes Davy's practice in relation to the flinner, arguing that these objects in her work exist um, within time in a way that doesn't rely on, say, capitalist metrics of productivity and progress. Um, and Davy herself has been quoted in The New Yorker, calling herself a flaneuse who never leaves her apartment. Um, what frustrates this line of comparison, though, um, is the fact that the private space of the apartment um, does not lend itself to the spirit of public um, exploration, unfettered idling, or the lofty aim of documenting evidence in the city of Paris. Um, of course, there's also the fact that Edge's photographs um, do not lack figures because he has retreated from photographing people. Um, it was just the nature of the medium at the time. There would have been people on the street again, um, they just didn't get captured. On the other hand, Davy is intentionally excluding figures from her photographs. But the interesting aspect of this composition is that both artists do seem to be considering their work as a kind of evidence, as something unsettling and something that cannot be contemplated in a disinterested manner. The photograph, like evidence of a crime, points back to a person. So what is the organizing principle behind these four photographs? Um, we may return to the quote from Legatus to glean some more insight. Davy goes on to write after describing her renunciation of the figure, quote, the burden of image theft as Louise Maul put it, um, had something to do with my retreat, but also a gradual seeping in of a kind of biographical reticence, perhaps connected to my personal, to my present reservations around telling my story, end quote. The quote references um, Louise Maul, uh, who was a French filmmaker born and died in the 20th century, famous for his documentary films. Um, here's a passage from an article on Ma's um, documentary, Phantom India, which is a six hour documentary film about India that aired in seven episodes on BBC television in 1969. Um, quote, filming a pair of women gleaning bits of grain in a field, he, the director, feels like a thief, stealing something ineffable from these nameless, faceless figures. He is right to feel this way, but is a voyeur who is aware of what he's doing any better than one who isn't? So this image, this idea of image theft um, seems to have played an important role in motivating Davy to produce the figureless photographs that we've seen. Um, so what does Davy mean by image theft? Mm, there is evidence to suggest that Davy's turn toward the figureless photograph um, was triggered by a rather specific event in her life, um, which is a public altercation um, with an unconsenting subject of a photograph of hers um, 
on the street in Brixton, London. Um, but the instance, um, this biographical instance, seems to be illustrating um, a larger issue that Davy has been grappling with. So she used to make photographs, um, portraits, such as the portrait shown um, titled Jane. Um, and this is from 1979. So the turn toward the figure that's photographed um, was also a turn away from such portraits. Why might Davy have um, retreated from the genre of portraiture altogether? Is there a quality that makes portraiture inherently image thieving? Um, how might Davy consider this particular work um, on the slide image theft? So some background, uh, Jane is Davy's sister. Um, this high contrast indie rock portrait was produced while Davy was working in Canada as a street photographer and portraitist of um, musicians and artists before starting art school at UCSD. The sitter is depicted in a vulnerable position. Um, she is nude, her eyes are cast downward in what appears to be a melancholic contemplation. Um, does she seem to want to be photographed? I'm not sure. Um, could it be the reproduction of her sister's body in this large um, 50 by 40 centimeter format um, which exposes her sister's breast um, and vulnerability. Um, it was this that Davy began to second guess. Here is another portrait um, from the same period titled Kate and Jane. Um, again, these are her siblings. They are outdoors, perhaps in a more comfortable position, lying down in the grass. Um, Kate on the left um, appears to be troubled. Um, however, Jane on the right is presented this time staring straight at the camera. Um, unlike in the previous portrait, Jane, there is no obvious ethical transgression on the part of the photographer, um, at least judging from the content of the photograph. Um, what in, the, in this case might constitute image theft then? Um, perhaps vulnerability or nudity is not what makes Davy hesitate. Um, rather, it's simply the depiction of others, regardless of their condition or their context. Um, one of the solutions to this dilemma that Davy comes up with, um, as we've seen, is the figureless photograph. Um, but another solution was to for her um, to portray herself as her subject matter. So this was when Davy's writing becomes um, increasingly important as a means of self-disclosure. Davy's films consist of several recurring motifs, reading essays, recording herself, and listening to her own voice. Um, so this is how they work. Davy has the essay written out. Um, in this case, uh, we see a still from Hemlock Forest and another from Lake Goddess. Um, she has the essay written out beforehand. Um, sometimes it's printed on paper, um, as we see on the right. Sometimes it's on her computer, um, as we see on the left. Um, or she has it recorded um, and she's wearing an earpiece um, and she walks around her apartment. Um, again, the full news of the interior, that theme comes up. Um, she's walking around her apartment, listening to her own voice and then repeating the sentences um, in a manner that is full of pauses. Um, that is, um, and it's fits and starts meditative, almost trance-like. Mm, I should note too that the films are not always completely set in her apartment. Often they cut back and forth between public and um, private space, but the emphasis on the domestic remains strong. Um, and when she does leave her apartment, the shots feel like a foray into a strange world. Um, and this is when we're looking um, at an inward turn right, on the part of the artist. Uh, we're seeing the self being disclosed in a performative way across media. Um, the self is looping um, almost like the sound that loops into her ear, out from her mouth and into the recording device again. In her film, Notes on Blue, Davy writes, um, or rather speaks about Derek Jarman, Homer, Anne Sexton, and a range of other interlocutors. At one point in the film, she says, quote, I enjoyed being the actor at the center of my own drama, end quote. Regarding the performance of the self, um, Davy spoke to Laura Hoffman for Art Forum in 2016, saying, quote, I've always had an urge to tell stories that are personal and intimate. And I thought it would be a solution to link these personal anecdotes to narratives from literature and history. I thought if I could make these connections across time, not just speak of my inner world and personal memories, 
but linked them to these other histories, especially literary ones. It would give the confessional a visibility that can be hard to secure with this type of material. So in light of the self-disclosing impulse, let's return to the four photographs. Has the self been extracted from these photographs um, along with the figure? Mm, I don't think so. While these Moira Davy photographs um, in the Kemper's collection are in no way traditional self-portraits, I think they are nonetheless representations of the self and they tell the narrative of the self. They are perhaps just representations of the self that have been deferred onto objects and to the interior space. This photo receiver was taken in 2003, um, which you'll note lies outside of the tenure period of so-called retreat, um, whose themes and anxieties have extended through Davy's body of work thus far. If we look closely at this photo, we can see traces of a human presence, despite there being no figures in the composition. One can see the warm golden glow emanating from two hazy rectilinear panels on the receiver, um, an indication that the receiver is on and picking up radio, radio signals, which then suggests the presence of sound in the room, um, which can be music, voice, or even just static. The receiver beckons us almost like a living entity in an otherwise sparsely decorated room. In addition to the glow of the receiver, there are four glass cylinders um, sitting on a table in the foreground. They seem to be beakers since they have these pouring lips. Um, and the smudges on the glass, um, which we can see if we look closely, um, indicate that they've been in use. Just as the messy stack of CD cases um, here next to the receiver, which has a round CD player mounted on top of it, is evidence of this interior having been lived in. Even what we might initially think of as bare and empty walls enclosing the pieces of furniture on the receiver and other personal objects are in fact activated by this delicate, almost ghostly play of light and shadow. We're inclined to read these objects then as personal artifacts. Um, and because Davy does not place herself or any other person within the frame, we are invited to speculate and ask ourselves what kind of person lives here. Next, we'll look at speaker. We already noticed earlier that there is in fact evidence of life in the details um, behind the speaker. Um, look at the shadow um, in the previous slide that draws the eye um, back toward the details. Um, the source of light seems to be coming from the bottom right corner um, across the diagonal and you just get right to these details. Um, so what are these details? Again, um, you can see just sort of detritus um, from her daily life, uh, but I want to focus on this blurry um, black and red form in the back here. It's actually the spine of a book titled Mother Reader, Essential Writings on Motherhood, which Davy edited in 2001. The book is hidden in its blurriness, but it nonetheless presents itself as a point of intrigue. So here, um, I want to um, look at the chat and interact with some of you all. Um, we'll first look at floor and then light in this manner. And I want to ask you all, um, in what ways might Davy be performing herself um, in floor and light? And we can infer, um, and what can we infer about the person taking these photographs? Um, he, here is the first one. Um, this is floor. And um, by the way, this is a view under Davy's bed. Um, so what might this photograph be telling us about Davy? And there's no wrong answers at all. Um, this is all, we're just trying to sort of feel out the atmosphere of these photographs. Let's see, Peter says, Davy's floor reminds me of Duchamp's dust breeding. Yes, yes, I think that is definitely a deliberate um, reference. Um, and there is that, that element of chance, right, in floor, where um, we, don't, we don't think um, she, arrange the dust in this particular way. Um, Davy actually has a very famous um, essay called um, Photography and Accident um, that, yeah, she um, has published um, in index cards and she sort of revels in this, this accidental moment in photography where you can capture um, like things in nature or um, sort of detritus in the apartment um, that isn't necessarily um, like a product of the human hand. Yeah. 
Um, thank you, Meredith, for putting deaf breeding into the chat. Um, Frisha says, I'm interested in the way um, that it's not clean. Yes. Um, being interested in one's home's interior doesn't mean that one's interested in cleaning. Also gender. Yes. Um, where do I even begin with that? Um, no, there's so many, there's so many great associations in here. Um, yes, being interested in one's home interior doesn't mean that one's interested in cleaning. Um, one could be specifically fascinated, right, in the dirty, um, in sort of upending these gender norms of um, clean versus dirty, and sort of, you know, working working with these binaries that are, um, I think, present in our everyday lives. Um, you know, what does it mean for an artist um, who is um, presenting as a woman to be photographing, you know, not only the you know, dirty parts of her apartment, but also, you know, really sort of performing herself and really owning um, the fact that she lives here. Um, Dr. Miller says it evokes an expansive natural landscape. Yes. Um, yeah, and that was one of the categories that I thought of um, sort of positioning this, this picture, this particular picture next to. Um, as we'll see, well, as we see here, um, this competition is sort of really framed like a landscape. Um, we have these expansive bands of color. Um, first, this dark brown at the top, um, this sort of amber floor color um, at the bottom, and um, this what may look like a horizon line, right? With these sort of ambiguous dust shapes. Um, we can see them as figures sort of receding into the distance. Um, but then, you know, our reading of this as a landscape, if we didn't know, is sort of frustrated by this uh, plastic bag in the back um, that is sort of playing off of the plastic hanging down from um, the bed. Yeah. And then one more, um, Janeth says, the placement of body in context to space, right? Where, where is the photographer here? Where is the camera being positioned? Um, and where is the viewer then consequently being positioned? We are being positioned very low to the ground. Um, we're not, you know, taking a, a low angle shot um, from the top, right? Um, and so that really positions us to be very intimate um, in the apartment space. Okay, that's all for now um, for this. Um, I will I will want to add um, a few things. Um, and so I don't, nobody has brought up this idea of maybe decay or um, memento mori, um, which I will. So th these are again, dust bunnies um, and the plastic sheet hanging over the hardwood floorboards. Um, this is again, um, a plastic bag in the background. Um, so, you know, we're peering through the narrow space um, of this bed. And yeah, there's like these associations with dirtiness. Um, there's these associations with unclean, um, uncleanly, like maybe um, neglect, right? And the, the idea of decay of the self, um, I think serves also as a memento mori, which is a theme um, that's present in still life, um, where a piece of art is designed to remind the viewer of their own mortality. Um, in a way, these photographs uh, not only show a domestic space, right, um, that has been lived in, but they give us a hint too of what the world of these interior spaces, um, these spaces that humans have made and used might look like when they outlive us or how our dead skin cells might accumulate as dust under the bed and stay there long after we've moved out, you know, um, or they might get mingled with the next occupants of our homes um, and really sort of starts to make us think um, long-term and not just about time as sort of a linear you know, um, maybe like capitalistic um, progression, but also as sort of, we, we, we're invited to think about the cyclical time um, and also of ideas of infinity. Um, and I wanna add too that in an article titled Women's Time in Theory, uh, the scholar Emily After notes that Davies photographs invite reading based on notions of archive, memory, fetish, and domestic interiority. Um, after, however, introduces another idea, which is that Davies' work engages with the theme of the untimely, um, the outmoded, uh, which is to say that she delights in this detritus of life. Um, the notion of memento mori can also be used to describe the way Davy works. Um, the C prints or the chromogenic prints um, that you're seeing were produced using an analog camera. Um, she decidedly has stayed away from um, these newer technologies. Um, so there's an analog camera used to capture these images um, as well as what is pictured. 
um, Davy is drawn to what some might consider outmoded technologies. Um, this has to do with her sort of overall approach. Um, there's a kind of slowness to it. There's a refusal of these sort of capitalist um, notions of um, you know, instrumentalized time, um, productivity, et cetera. Um, and another, another theme that sort of comes up in her work is this idea of her body um, sort of breaking down um, the process of you know, time on the body. Um, so in any case, the dots, there are little pieces of evidence um, and they point to something spectral, right? Something that has already passed. In the next slide, we have light. Um, and this one is just so, to me, so enigmatic. Um, it's so intriguing. Um, so what could we possibly infer from um, this picture about the person taking it? Um, and I can look in the chat. Is she interested in the idea of the abject? Yes, um, she is. And this is also sort of the idea of the abject um, sort of in her essays is kind of linked to her ideas of motherhood. Um, she writes about this and talks a lot about it actually with the writer Kate Sambrino. Um, when she was pregnant, um, she actually took a lot of photographs um, sort of of herself. And um, yeah, she sort of arranged the domestic space in such a way that um, really kind of positioned herself or positioned um, the way she lived. Um, next to this idea of the abject. Yes. Um, so does anyone have any impressions about light? Um, if not, I can say some things or um, we can maybe think of um, the idea of point of view. So I think earlier um, someone asked about the where, where the person is positioned um, in relation to space. So how my, um, where, where is the camera here or where is the gaze falling? Um, what can that tell us about the, the person? Yeah, and it's, I think it, this one is a particularly hard question. Um, so I can throw out some examples maybe, um, or some speculations. Um, perhaps this is someone looking, um, someone that's laying down in bed, right? Um, perhaps this light fixture, it depends on where it is um, in the house. Um, but perhaps someone is laying down in bed, looking up. Um, you might picture the point of view of someone who is in the state of you know, languid and poetic boredom. Um, or you can think of it as a person who has insomnia or anxiety, perhaps um, someone who has been staring at the ceiling. Um, and there can be more than one possible placement, um, says Janice. Yes, thank you. Um, I think you mean, um, or I'm assuming you mean where, where the light fixture can be positioned, right, in the house. Um, this could be a dining room ceiling. Um, this could be a bedroom ceiling. It could be a bathroom ceiling. Um, and we don't know that context. So I think in that way, it sort of opens our minds to sort of associations. Um, thank you. Um, my first thought, says Janice, um, was cranking the head back, yes, um, and feeling the discomfort of that action. Absolutely, yeah. To get this sort of head-on view of the light, you'd have to really, yeah, um, have your head cranked all the way back. And again, yeah, that speaks to the discomfort um, of the speaker and perhaps you know, someone who's not particularly comfortable um, in her apartment. Um, Elaine, or Peter first. Um, Peter, I'm thinking about William Eggleston. Yes, um, oh no, I can't click on that. <laughs> um, but yes, I will, um, I will address that. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, I'm actually not familiar with the work of Peter Eggleston. Um, so I will table that for now, but um, if we wanna have a conversation later, I'm happy to. Um, Elaine says, looking up at the bare bones fixture um, for light only, not decor. Yes, um, we are looking at the um, sort of the skeletal um, fixture of the light. Um, and so as we talked sort of about like abstract photography earlier, uh, we were looking at um, sort of this light fixture as a form and tone and color. Um, and so, yeah, we're, but at the same time, we're not, we're not looking at, at it perhaps as decor, right? We're looking at it, um, we can look at it as personal artifact. Um, and it's also not sort of an ornament of um, the house. It is just presented as is, as object. Um, Emily says, since, is it, since it is an overhead light, I think of the moment one walks into a house or a room and turns on the light, the space of a threshold comes to mind. Yes, um, the sort of liminal space, um, the sort of room that perhaps has no, um, 
yeah, has no function. Yeah, so we are sort of running out of time at this point, um, but I want to point out perhaps some other ways that Davy continually um, continues to create work um, that she might consider image theft. Um, and she does this subtly uh, using words. So one of the characteristics of Davy's essays um, is that they read like fragmentary musings, at times like a loose collection of aphorisms. Um, they are bursting at the seams with references and citations. Um, so for a talk on um, Louise Bourgeois, she writes, summer 2009, um, New York, reading LB, Louise Bourgeois, for the third time, hold up all weekend making a big push. Reading Bourgeois, Le Bovici, um, Beauvoir, Dura, Borges, intense immersion in other lives. I've indulged in a month long imbibing of Bourgeois and Dura. James M. Cain's Mildred Pierce was a catalyzing element. Now I'm having trouble finishing because of my doubts about including too much Dura in a talk about Louise Bourgeois. Davy ends up titling that talk LBMPMD after Louise Bourgeois, Mildred Pierce, and Margaret Dura. The initials are enigmatic, um, they're hints rather than direct references. And she's using one figure, for instance, Dura, to indirectly comment on another um, bourgeois. And this is a conscious tactic. Um, this is what she does in order to disclose herself um, to me. This act of deferral is also one of image theft. Um, and she takes from other artists and writers as well. Um, she fragments their texts and incorporates them into hers to tell her own story. Um, and another way that Davy continues to commit image theft um, is through careful and detailed observation. Um, it, here, um, she describes a scene from the subway, quote, girl with aqua nail polish concentrated on her iridescent um, mag magenta phone, three strands of fat pearls wrapped around her wrist, long dark hair hides her face, um, parenthetical subway. Um, and she does go out and start taking pictures of people again. Um, this is her subway writer series from 2011. Um, these are photos she took, folded and mailed to galleries and friends as is, so we can see the stamps um, and the addresses on them. And um, so again, we see this preoccupation with traces of daily life. Um, we see time on the surface of the photographs themselves. Um, and this series is intriguing because it's actually, it was actually the image of a person writing in a notebook on the subway that served as a catalyst for Davy's return to portraiture, um, the return of the human figure to her work. And people on the subway continue to fascinate Davy. Um, these images, um, these themes of image theft, um, representation, and this concern with intimate worlds comes to a head actually in a film that Davy made in 2016 titled Hemlock Forest. So I'm going to end the talk by looking at how Davy worked through the issue of image theft in the making of Hemlock Forest, or rather a specific, a specific shot in Hemlock Forest of people riding on the subway. And the shot was an homage to a film by Belgian filmmaker Chantal Ackerman. Um, so let's first go to 1977, to the film that inspired Davies. Um, so this is a still from News From Home, um, which is an avant-garde documentary set during Ackerman's time in New York. Um, when we look at the shot of News From Home, what do we see? We see a public space, namely the New York City subway. The shot is predominantly an aloe green that is once antiseptic and soothing. In the shot, which is held for three long minutes, we see several subway riders turn and apprehend the camera, um, most notably a man in a lime green shirt here um, and purple hat who stares at the camera. Um, we can guess, though we will never know how he is feeling. Um, maybe he's annoyed that a stranger is filming without asking permission, um, wondering what the footage is going to be used for, um, or simply tired, jostled as he is by the subway as it shutters down the tracks. Now, 40 years later, um, Moira Davey recreated Chantal Ackerman's subway scene in 2016. Here, we can see the New York City subway is slightly updated. Um, there's noticeably more chrome and the graffiti has been erased. Um, the glare of the lights is almost overwhelming, but still we see subway riders, um, as is the case with the women, uh, the woman with the patterned shirt here. And beside her, there is a child um, who is gazing at the camera, not smiling, um, perhaps wondering the same thing that the man from 40 years ago wondered. 
So in an essay titled um, Hemlock Forest, Davy writes, quote, um, views from home by Chantal Ackerman comprises breathtaking views of Manhattan. A third of the way into the film, there's a subway shot aimed straight down the one train. Um, and she mentions um, this man in lime green. Um, Taken aback, she writes, he lurches, scowls at the camera, then turns on his heel and walks quickly away through the open doors to the next car. She says, I have an urge to recreate the scene by asking cinematographers to film a contemporary version, but I immediately begin to feel anxious and depressed about the idea. The idea of filming this quasi illegal scene both makes me sick with nerves and if I can pull it off is a huge rush. In Davy's description of her exhilarating and frightening filming process, we begin to parse out this feeling, um, this dilemma of image theft in a positive light, um, perhaps as a kind of motivation. And as we see, she does go and film the scene in the end. All right, thank you for joining me for this talk and I'm happy to take any questions now if you have any. Uh, just jump back on here to look at our Q&A, but first, Jenny, thank you so much for that beautiful reading of Davy's photographs and for sort of contextualizing this um, and her larger practice. I know I'm very excited to explore more of her work and her writing. Um, your mention of, um, was it Notes on Blue is making me think of Maggie Nelson's Bluets and maybe some similarities in, the, in their practice. So um, thank you for that. I'm looking um, at our Q&A and we have a question about from an attendee about who were some of the artists Maura Davy was inspired by or modeling after? Yeah, that is a good, um, that's a really good question. Um, so there are many, um, there are people sort of um, that she sort of learned from or were um, influenced by during, you know, the 80s, um, during this period of renunciation. Um, and there was also, you know, her interlocutors sort of every day. Um, and I'm really glad you brought up Maggie Nelson because I think there is actually a direct reference um, in Notes on Blue, which is sort of a sort of a meditation on the color blue. Um, she has this shot um, out of her window, out her window of a construction tarp that is blue. Um, and that is actually an exact um, image from Maggie Nelson's Bluette. So it makes me wonder, right, if there are these resonances. And she's so keen on making um, connections sort of between herself and other artists. Um, but in terms of, let's see, who, who um, Moira Davy was inspired by or modeling after? Yeah, I think um, part of sort of the context um, of her biography that um, I didn't get to really talk about um, for time constraints um, was the fact that the shift um, that occurred in the decade following 1984 um, was also sort of mirroring a shift that was going on in the art world at the time. Um, so during this time, there was this sort of push toward neoconceptualism. And um, a lot of it was happening sort of at UCSD. Um, so before arriving at the school, um, Davy had been making these sort of straight on like punk-ish, um, like black and white portraits of her family, right? Um, and so she had this very subjective approach at first, um, but this ran counter um, to what um, Jen, um, this ar um, article writer, um, Janique Vigier says um, that this impulse ran counter to the period's um, strident critiques of representation. Um, and these critiques of representation are neoconceptual. Um, and so, and that was a movement that came about sort of at the end of the 1970s um, in reaction to modernism, um, in reaction to late capitalism and, and the pr proliferation of consumer images as well. Um, so a person that um, Davy actually sort of worked for as an assistant um, was Alan McCollum. Um, and he has these series called um, Perpetual Photo, which are, they're more, right, they're more conceptual, they're more abstract than Davy's photographs. Um, in the Perpetual Photo series, um, the images are very, are, they're um, taken from sort of pictures that are in um, t the TV, right? So if on a show, a, um, an image, a, a photograph is shown in a scene, um, he would sort of zoom in on that photograph until it was very blurry. Um, and there's also people sort of working there, um, such as Cindy Sherman with her untitled film stills. Um, so 
they're, they're, um, and Cindy Sherman's untitled film spells are again, sort of, they're self portraits, um, but they gesture to this fictional narrative um, of the self. And so I think um, those are some principal people that Davy um, may have modeled herself after. Um, but in terms of her interlocutors, they really span, um, you know, literary and artistic influencers. Yeah. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Yes, we have some more questions coming in. Thank you for sharing more about that. Um, Frisia asks, it seems like Davy teaches us that flanosing is always an interior practice, whether one's inside or outside, I love that, um, of the apartment. Would you consider Davy a diarist? Um, it's not, I wouldn't, um, I mean, it's not up to me to say that Davy is a diarist. She is a diarist. Um, she <laughs> all, publishes, um, fragments um, of her diaries. Um, she has this one essay called Transit of Venus, which is just sort of diary fragments. Um, and she's very conscious about sort of keeping a journal. Um, and, you know, her works are fascinating. Like I would recommend you check them out. Um, and so, yeah, part of this sort of daily documenting process is, um, you know, and it's not only, she's not only a diarist um, when she's writing, right? Her photography also has this sort of diaristic um, element to them. Um, and so she's very interested in sort of documenting documenting her own existence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a related to that a question in the chat. I'm just trying to go back and find it um, about which uh, photograph was the most um, autobiographical if I can. I'm trying to find that one. Sorry. Um, well, I can come back to that. Okay, um, let's see. So another question that we have is, oh, it's in, sorry, it's in the q and I'm moving between both windows. So from uh -huh. Elaine, we have, which of Davy's four photos here do you think is the most autobiographical? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It depends on um, how you would define autobiographical, right? I mean, if the dust under her bed is her actual skin cells, then, you know, is that trace of the artist more or less autobiographical than say, you know, beakers that she might have used in her dark room um, as you see in receiver, or, you know, the book that she edited, Mother Reader, which is um, present in speaker. Um, maybe perhaps the least autobiographical or the least explicitly autobiographical is light, right? Because we don't get these little references. Um, but yeah, I think it definitely depends. Um, and I think the longer you read into the photographs, the more sort of resonances you might find um, between you know, her, her um, actual whole body of work, right? Um, and yeah, and what's represented. Yeah, thank you. Another question that we have from Angela is, if you could say something about the deep ambivalence Davy feels about photographing people that she is both retreating, retreating from and embracing the rush of image stealing. Yeah, she's, Right, there is this deep ambivalence to it. And I think that is part of what motivates a lot of her um, shots. Um, so she has this phrase that she says a lot called the, the opposite of a low hanging fruit. Um, and she describes certain shots that she takes, um, you know, at, in her practice as, you know, some, some shots might be very easy for her to take that she calls it a low hanging fruit and she's not exactly satisfied by it. Um, but then this particular, the subway shot, um, which we can go back to, um, is what she calls the opposite of a low hanging fruit. Because um, not only did she have, you know, all this preparation she had to put in um, before taking the shot, like um, she had to, you know, get every the camera people together, she had to sort of coordinate this. But actually when she was filming this, she wasn't standing in the train car. She was standing in that little interstitial um, liminal space um, between the train cars. And so that place was really like rocking, right? Um, so it's this very uncomfortable, long, um, this long take. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, um, but yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Um, we also have a, a question from Peter who's curious about how you first got interested in Davy's work. Why? These photographs are very relatable to us, especially we are spending more time at home and paying more attention to the ordinary these days. Absolutely, so could you share a little bit about how you first got yeah. interested in Davy's work? Yeah, so actually the first time I saw Davy's work um, was at the Art Institute of Chicago um, a couple of years back. And she had, and Les Goddess is actually um, sort of there, it's part of their permanent collection. Um, but there was something about the way, um, it was really, I think, um, her voice, right? 
So in that film, she is showing her photographs. Um, she's actually showing her photographs from the like the punk portraiture era. Mm -hmm. um, and she's talking about her family. And she's also drawing these references between her own family and that of Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, so these connections across time. And it, what really drew me in was this sort of integrated like multimedia, uh, um, yeah, like multimedia practice where she's, she's been writing, she's speaking, um, she's showing photographs and she's also pacing around her apartment um, showing us the space and this very intimate um, sort of space. And that's, that is how I started getting um, really interested in Maura Davy. It was very sort of seductive um, and as I think most of her work is. Um, and then there was this occasion of the publication of the new collection of essays, um, which I couldn't wait to get my hands on. Um, so yeah, that was, those are sort of the um, motivations behind this talk. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we have also another question from Edmund who asks, which features of capitalism most disturb Davy? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, and scholars have sort of talked about this idea of um, instrumentalized time or um, sort of the day being divided. Um, and this kind of goes back to um, Peter's point about quarantine these days, right? The day being sort of divided into hours and we're sort of made to um, sort of mechanize our lives. And I think part of what Davy is pushing against um, in sort of the slow repetitive cyclical way she talks um, in her video, in her films um, and in these pictures of the quotidian um, is this aspect of um, how time is supposed to be used. Um, so, and then there's also sort of um, representation and this exploitation of images um, and consumer images. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. We also have a question from Janice who asks about, um, would like to hear your interpretation of the function of or use of footnotes. Okay, um, so in, in Davy's work. Um, so her notes, that's very interesting because I see actually all of her writing as sort of being you know, a long footnote or a long section of footnotes um, because it is so heavily referential. And sometimes, you know, like quotations from say like Walter Benjamin's Arcades Projects are just dropped in, right, um, with, with a footnote. Um, and so in a way, the use of the footnote is really interesting in writing because um, it on one hand is a kind of deferral, but on the other hand, um, it's a way of sort of accumulating um, evidence again. Um, and so th that, I think th this idea of deferral and accumulation is um, maybe how I would interpret the footnotes, but yeah, really interested in that. Thank you. I love that idea of her work being sort of one, one, long, one long footnote. Um, does, does a Davy use a lot of footnoting in her, in her uh, writing then? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it, sometimes it's hard to even tell between, um, you know, her voice, like what she's saying um, and something that is being quoted. And I think in that way, it's, um, it's a very democratic or a very networked um, sort of writing style. We have some time for a few more questions if anyone would like to share one in the Q&A. If not, I also have a question if I might be able to, to ask one, Jenny. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I hope that this is maybe not the best place to finish in thinking about this concept, but I would love to hear you share a little bit more about this concept of memento mori, which you discussed when looking at the photograph floor. And I'm wondering if you feel like the photographs are elegies of sorts, these sort of reminders of the fragility and shortness and even beauty of, of human life. Yeah, that I mean, that's such a huge question, but um, yeah, no, I definitely think they are. Um, and I'm thinking sort of of the concept of memento mori, like, I don't know, the 17th century Dutch painting of um, Peter Kloss, or this, um, anything that sort of involves like a skull or a candle sort of symbolizing, um, you know, like the shortness or the mortality of people. Um, and we don't see those kinds of symbols, right, in um, Davy's work, but we sort of feel it um, as an atmosphere. Um, this atmosphere of like emptiness and speculating as to what these interiors are going to look like um, sort of when we're gone. Um, and for Davy, this idea of elegy, um, in a lot of her writing, she does um, write about death um, and she writes about grief. Um, so when, for example, Chantal Ackerman died, um, she wrote about that extensively um, in the same essay. 
um, where she talks about sort of paying this homage to Ackerman. Um, and something that she wrote in that essay um, is a quote that starts, I'm reliant on the words of others um, and I glom on to the dead. And that's a very sort of succinct way of talking about her practice, I think. Um, being sort of reliant on others, not just being, you know, the individual genius um, of her works, um, but really sort of being intertextual. And then at the same time, um, quote unquote, glomming onto the dead, being sort of obsessed or fixated on the elegy um, on people who have passed. Yeah, and I, th I think that's definitely, that is present in her works. Thank you. Um, very excited to look at Davy's work again and to start reading some of her her writing as well um, following your talk. This really was um, a really wonderful exploration of Davy's practice. Uh, and if we don't have any more questions in the chat or the Q&A, I will close by thanking Jenny for, for your time and for sharing um, some of your research with us. And also want to thank um, Patty White from Here Inc, who has been providing our captions for us today. The talk will, as I mentioned, will be available on our YouTube channel. The link is in our chat um, and it should be available sometime next week if you'd like to come back and revisit some of um, what we discussed today. So thanks so much and have a good rest of your day, everyone.